Thank you, Nezisa. Um, I think I'm much more privileged than you uh, to have been invited first by you, uh, Professor Ratele, as well as uh, to then have been introduced by you because, as Nezisa said, uh, we encountered each other when I became her mentor um, when she was in the unit th that I used to work at. And to see how she has grown is just absolutely incredible for me. Um, it actually makes me a bit emotional. And then to see that she managed to snag Kofano <laughs> Ratel, whom I wanted to be my supervisor when I was doing my PhD. I said, God, you are so lucky. <laughs> But I know that, um, as Prof. Ratel has also intimate, uh, intimated, he's also very lucky to have found her. She's extremely driven, extremely powerful, um, and so it's quite really a, a pleasure and a privilege for me. I'm going to be talking uh, to us today, in fact, just sharing perspectives on sexuality and sexuality-related violence among LGBTQI in South Africa. And I want to state it up front that um, this is actually an area of work that I'm only just starting now. In fact, I started it in 2014, and, and that's how Neziswa, uh, actually, I'm sure that's how she came to tell um, Prof. Ratel about me, because she knows that I can go on and on talking about this kind of research amongst LGBT, as though I've already done some work on it. But in fact, I only started in 2014, and I soon stopped because I didn't have funding. But in this time, I've been... Um, doing a lot of thinking, and uh, these are the perspectives, I'm, perspectives that I'm going to share with you. So um, I want to start by just looking at how uh, sexuality is considered uh, within the South African space, not just in academia, but just, just broadly. Um, if you look at the Constitution, South Africa is uh, well recognized for being extremely, the, if not the most advanced, and the most progressive when it comes to issues of uh, plural, plural sexualities, uh, in that it recognizes not only heterosexuality, but also uh, different types of other types of sexuality. Uh, and there are protections provided as such uh, to people who belong to, to, to other types of sexuality. And, and these include lesbians, gays, bisexual uh, people, people who identify as trans, uh, transsex, queer, and intersex. Um, so the protections are quite visible in the Constitution. Um, however, when you look at the everyday experience of life uh, for people who identify as LGBTQI, and when you look at the organization uh, of social and health services in, in other domains in South Africa, <laughs> South Africa, despite its great constitution on this issue, actually remains not only highly homophobic and heterosexist, but in fact upholds and privileges a heterosexuality over other forms of sexuality. So, in fact, the, 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 the kind of, um, um, the ways in which we can talk about how progressive South Africa is when it comes to LGBTI issues only remains when we talk about the Constitution. Outside of that, there isn't such a, a progressiveness. Um, and, and besides that space, the, you know, the, the, the public uh, and government space, also, we find in public health research, and you'll forgive me, I'll largely focus on that because that's my orientation, that's my background. Um, in public health research, we also find that it's really only heterosexuality that is uh, privileged, uh, and not just heterosexuality in general, but male experiences of uh, sexuality and heterosexuality. It is, public health research is largely unconcerned with other forms of being. And so we find, in fact, that even the focus that we see paid to um, homosexuality is only because of HIV. And, and so much of public health research focuses uh, almost entirely on men who have sex with men because of their heightened risk uh, 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 to HIV, both as uh, those who can be infected and those who can transmit uh, the virus. And, and it ends there. And when you start searching for literature, on uh, sexuality-related uh, research and sexuality-related violence research in particular in South Africa, you are going to largely find sexuality-related violence among LGBTI only in connection to HIV. Much of it, you're going to find papers that talk about forced sex in relation to HIV in, in, in terms of how it uh, increases uh, susceptibility to HIV infection. As though HIV is, the, is all there is to worry about when it comes to sex. And as though HIV itself is completely delinked uh, 
from unconnected uh, to and, and uninformed by all kinds of oppressions and struggles. Um, and so much of my talk is going to depart from this point that when we talk about sexuality related uh, violence research, it's informed by this paradigm that only makes it important amongst LGBTI as far as it connects to HIV. And yet we find a reason to say public health research on sexuality related violence among LGBTI is necessary. We can't own and, and needs to be broadened and go further than just HIV because of course we know that um, oppressions that heighten one's exposure to various health and, and social risks, including HIV, are connected to other experiences of uh, oppression connected to uh, sex, one's sex, gender, race, and, and class. And so it's extremely important to acknowledge that we, the, the kind of populations that we focus our research on um, are not only uh, vectors of disease, you know, HIV, but in fact have all sorts of other uh, oppressions that they're dealing with that would need to be attended to if we're talking about sex, uh, sexuality related uh, violence research. So if one begins to say why is there this paradox that on the one hand we have uh, constitutional pronouncements on um, you know, different forms of, of sexuality that are so progressive and yet on the other hand we have you know the topic is entirely invisible. Uh, and one finds that one of the reasons is of course uh, South Africa's colonial import of homophobia. And, and I've made it clear that this is an import of homo colonialism, imported homophobia, not homosexuality. It isn't something that only existed when uh, colonialists um, you know, arrived in, in 1652. It's something that existed before. And so despite what you'll often hear from Africans themselves, and especially African leaders, that this is a white disease, this is, this is an African, this is something that we never had before. It actually did exist, as with all other cultures in the world. Uh, various sexualities have already existed in Africa. Um, it is homophobia that we cannot say existed before colonialism. Um, and, and we know, of course, that it, it did not just enter with colonialists, but in fact was then spread and cemented in a very particular and aggressive way through Christianity that uh, brought with it a particular way of um, talking about uh, permitted and, and, and prohibited types of sexualities. And I think this is one of the things that become important when one talks about what it is that we need to decolonize when it comes to sexuality related violence uh, concerning LGBTI. Do we need to decolonize homophobia or do we need to decolonize thinking around homosexuality? Um, and so not only did the colonialists then uh, come in with these ideas uh, that were very homophobic, that um, you know, positioned homosexuality as something sinful, as something absolutely wrong, as something uh, only savages would, would uh, ever engage in. But it was also then codified and upheld through law, which criminalized um, not homosexuality broadly, but male same-sex conduct. And I'm making this particular distinction uh, for, for, for very important reasons that are going to uh, become clear later on. Because when we talk about sexuality related violence among LGBTI, we, know, we need to know the silences in, 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 in the work and the research that's done on this topic. And the silences as pertaining to which populations. Not all uh, LGBTI populations are equally rendered invisible by sexuality related uh, uh, violence research. And so back then, at a time where the only recognition that you had of uh, same-sex uh, 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 practices, where they were only recognized through these punitive laws that prohibited, um, I mean, the Immorality Act was amended and revised many times, and each, each time it emphasized that sex between males uh, was, was a punishable and a criminal offense. But even then, there was absolutely nothing said about female same-sex conduct. And it wasn't even that, you know, that there was, it was not said to be illegal. There, was, there were no laws that prohibited a female same-sex conduct. Not because it was considered, well, we actually don't care if, if women have sex with other women. It was because in the capitalist, patriarchal, uh, Eurocentric uh, model of the world, women 
and therefore their sexuality is only existed in relation to men. So it wasn't important, it was taken for granted that women's behavior is well understood, we have it under control, we own it, we regulate it, that you don't need to have laws. And not only that, in fact, heterosexuality was presumed for women, that women were, were, were heterosexual. Once again, because of this idea that their sexuality only existed in relation to, to men. I've included a quote here by Zetu Madaben, who's at UCT, whom I'd hoped would be here today because I absolutely, I'm desperate to, to, to work with her on this new work. Um, and, and, and so in, in one of her papers, she talks about how heterosexuality is the presumed sexual preference of most women. So the law is silent even when it prohibits, it's silent. But we're going to see how not just the law, but the entire field of um, uh, sexuality-related violence on LGBTI is much more silent on women than even uh, um, uh, uh, men. And part of this, um, of course, is, you know, I raised this, as I said, because it's very important for us to be able to understand how sexuality-related violence is uh, structured and, and, how, and, and who it focuses on. The other reason, besides this, you know, the colonial uh, import of um, homophobia that I talked about, part of this paradox that we have in South Africa is that, of course, also with regards to research, not just in South Africa but in the world over, the Western model has, was only just for the longest time antagonistic towards LGBTI. It only knew to characterize homosexual behavior as a disorder. Uh, as, a, as an illness. And so much of the research um, around this population uh, focused on devising uh, you know, means, chores, and testing them and, and promoting them. Um, and so th that was the focus of the research. And in fact, until HIV AIDS, public health research did not at all focus on LGBTI, LGBTQI, especially in our context, it, 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 it was silent. And so consequently, because we are dealing with a, a discipline, if I may call it, that has been silent on some of the population, there are prominent gaps and exclusions. If you start doing your literature reviews, you, they're just, when you're looking at sexual, uh, sexuality related violence as a whole, you, there are just silences when it comes to LGBTQI. And those have to do with, of course, the experiences of women. And yet, I find this extremely extraordinary that we don't have much sexuality-related violence research that focuses on women, considering that um, violence and gender-based violence in particular is so endemic in this country, that we are considered to have the highest rate in the world for a country not at war. Um, and so it's, 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 it, it speaks once again of, of, of the issues that I mentioned earlier about how it entered uh, uh, the space in South Africa when uh, colonialists came. So when we look at sexuality-related violence uh, broadly and we examine what it focuses on, much of it departs and remains within a heteronormative perspective. It only talks about sexual violence that is experienced. Let me not say it only largely talks about sexual, sexual violence that is experienced within a heteronormative context. And I must say, this has also influenced for the longest time until recently how I conducted uh, sexuality-related violence uh, research. I really, when I went and conducted my first research project in Begweni, uh, in PAL, that um, Nezus had read about uh, in her introduction of me, I went there to conduct a study that would be able to measure and quantify the extent of HIV risk among young women with multiple sexual partners. I did not specifically or explicitly say it was heterosexual young women with multiple sexual partners, but that's who I had in mind, right? And so I went in and I conducted my study and the findings amongst the lots of things I, that I found, I found extremely high levels of intimate partner violence. And I still did not think, because my orientation is so heteronormative, I didn't think to disentangle these experiences of interpartner violence and say oh, which ones occur within uh, non-heterosexual uh, relationships. And I went back, so based on this research and these findings, I could then go and uh, apply for funding. And I was extremely lucky, applied for funding from uh, NEPAD, 
was called then Nepal Spanish Fund. And I got it, first time application of, of, of such a, a large nature. And I, and I got the, the funding and I had absolutely no consideration of any other type of intimate partner violence context except the heterosexual one that, that uh, I'd been exposed to. And it was only in doing, when I, so I got funding to conduct an intervention that was going to use participatory action research methods to um, reduce gender-based violence. And it was only in the course of that research that I realized that there's a missing population. So the way in which the research was structured or the intervention was structured was to get all the key actors in the production of gender-based violence in that community. And those were classified into groups. So we had community action groups and each were targeted with a curricula that we co-developed with the members of the community uh, you know, to, to, to sensitize people about gender-based violence. And it was only as I started that I realized that there's a missing population. And I wouldn't have had that realization if it wasn't for uh, a research assistant that I employed who later on came out as lesbian. And we started having conversations, she and I, um, when coming back from the study site. We started having conversations and she kept saying, why do your questionnaires, the baseline questionnaires, why do they not address women? Why do they not take into account young women who may not only be uh, experiencing intimate partner violence from their male sexual partners, but from their female sexual partners as well. And I said, well, I didn't think that was uh, such a, a, a big, I, I hadn't thought about it. And I mean, even if it does exist, even if you do have uh, women who have sex with uh, women as, uh, in addition to men, I don't think it's such a, a big population. And she said to me, you'd be surprised. You are leaving out a major, major population here. When you're organizing, you, you, you're developing this fantastic intervention, there's a key population that you're missing. So because of that, I then arranged with uh, someone that I was told was an activist in, um, you know, for the LGBTI community there. I arranged if we could just set up a community gathering of LGBTI or people who identify as LGBTQI. And I said, just I organize it and I'll come and I'll talk to them and I'll tell them about this research and I'll see if there's any interest in, in, in people getting involved. And I got there expecting that I would meet five or six people. I got there to find a room full of young people, some as young as 11, who all individually identified as LGBTI. So now in another context, perhaps in Kailicha, if you found a room full of people, it wouldn't mean much because you're dealing with a very large population. In Begwen, in Begwen is a small population of like 18,000 to 20,000 people. So if you say you want a gathering of people who identify as LGBTI in the community, young people, by the way, because you haven't included everyone, and you get a room full of people, it's a, it's, you know, it was, it was surprising to me. And it was only through then that I came to understand that sexuality-related violence, for that matter, gender-based violence, is not limited to heterosexual uh, populations, that in fact it extends beyond it. But you won't see, it's entirely invisible because of the way in which you've been trained to only focus on these populations. It's invisible to you, you have not been trained to ask those questions, you have not even been trained or oriented to, to even wonder about the existence of this other population. And for me, whose research was on HIV, it also of course made sense that I'd only ever thought about heterosexual populations because though it's been shown that HIV is just as highly transmitted through non-heterosexual uh, con conduct, um, it was just not something that I'd been trained to, to address. So um, it was that realization then that said to me that sexuality-related violence amongst LGBTI must be part of the agenda because there's a, a population, and I can't share now the findings of that focus group discussion that I ran because it was just once off, as I said earlier, uh, I didn't have funding to go back. Um, but it was, it, it's really what uh, perked my interest. And so I came to understand that part of this lack of awareness is, you know, of, of this population as people who are also susceptible and at risk of experiencing intimate partner violence and all sorts of other gender-based violence was because of this HIV way of looking at uh, sexual violence. Uh, I think I've already said that prior to the HIV pandemic, sexual violence was not even a national issue, never mind sexual violence among LGBTI. Uh, the Gender and Health Research Unit uh, here at the MRC, when it started, in, I think in 1984, there wasn't much. And in fact, even when you start doing your literature searches, you don't see much about sexual violence written in the public domain. You don't see much. You only start seeing much of it as the HIV pandemic begins to take hold of South Africa. 
And as I said before, a lot of the studies that talk about sexual violence in this country then only talk about it, or largely talk about it in connection to, to HIV. Um, I also found that part of, of course, this um, exclusion of LGBTI when considering sexual violence had to do with how we only consider the body in South African, in, you know, in the kind of research that we do, I think uh, Floretta alluded to this, when it comes to sexual violence or any other victimization, we tend to focus on the body. The body is much more visible than all sorts of other ways in which the person has been uh, affected. And so the body, the, the, you know, the focus on the body then means that we are only going to look at specific health, identifiable health outcomes that are going to distract the body if we don't pay attention. Um, also then what I've found in connection to this is that sexuality related violence among LGBTQI has only for the longest time only mattered when connected to pathologies that are common to all. Hence this link or where the, the, the main link that's emphasized is the one between HIV and sexual violence is because it only really matters when LGBTQI are connected or, or, or at least have um, experiences that are connected to all sorts of other pathologies that are common to all of us. Uh, I think I've already mentioned that you see this very well in the kind of papers that are uh, published on sexual violence that occurs amongst LGBTI. It's largely in connection to HIV. Um, I think I've already said it that it, it and, and so this means that much of the research does not con, uh, consider the body or the person in, 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 in their totality. It doesn't consider context. It doesn't consider that the very lived experience of being LGBTQI is violent. That it isn't just episodic singular experiences of violence that you're going to get, but that the experience of living out your life as a gay or lesbian person in this country, despite all its constitutional pronouncements, is violent. And I got a sense of this uh, uh, last weekend. I was in KZN for a, a study that I'm doing on a different topic. And I just happened to stay in a lodge that had an event that had somehow attracted a huge population, a lot of people who were LGBTI. And of course, in because I had this talk coming up, I started talking to them about um, you know, their experiences of violence. And they talked about how, well, you know, there's violence that you're going to experience in the relationship. There are hate crimes that you're going to experience that are very visible. But in fact, the very experience of being gay is very violent. You go around and you are, one, one guy was saying, you know, you walk into a store and someone talks about how, oh, you know, and that on its, in, in its own is already violent to you. And so the way then in which the experience of sexual violence uh, uh, is found is, 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 is quite heightened because you're already someone who's living in, an, in, a, in a violent or rather in, in an endemic a context uh, with regards to violence. Uh, and so we, we focus on the body only, I uh, found also because we seem to think that homosexual bodies or LGBTI bodies only experience victimization. So the way in which it's written about it is not only just confined to writings linking sexual violence to, to HIV, but it completely lacks nuance. We just, you know, it's the, the writings only talk about how many, uh, you know, women have endured corrective rape, uh, how many uh, homosexual males are, 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 are raped, you know, and the extent of hate crimes, etc. There isn't anything else that's talked about, as though these bodies don't also have other experiences, as though they don't also experience resistance, or agency, or triumph, or resilience within that. Uh, 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 endemic uh, uh, context of violence. And I want to just say this is not just common to LGBTI, this consideration that only looks at whether you've been victimized but doesn't take an into consideration anything else that context that contests that experience. I also had a personal experience of it in, 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 uh, during my PhD. For one of my papers that focused on intimate partner violence, I looked at not just victimization, but at the responses that uh, young women uh, were giving to these experiences of violence. And I found quite a lot of agency there. I found that they were not just passively being beaten about. At times, they actively incited those violent episodes because of other benefits that they imagined they would get from the relationship. Um, and at times, they would retaliate. They would fight back. They, were, they weren't just passively 
victimized by violence. There, there were some responses that contrasted that experience. And so I decided in my paper, I would look, I even remember how I titled it originally, The Strength of the Weak, how women, young women negotiate uh, 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 violence in a context of um, uh, um, disempowerment. And one of the examiners of my page, this was about five years ago, who then had to decide if I was ready to defend my PhD, picked up this paper and completely freaked out, became extremely upset with me, said I was not going to defend this PhD, they would not let my thesis go through unless I changed that paper, because I simply cannot talk about agency when talking about a population that is experiencing such high levels of intimate partner violence. So of course my paper had detailed the kind of experiences of violence that they experienced in these relationships, and she could not handle that I was that, that this violence stood in tension with uh, you know, agency and, and, and contestation and resistance. She could not handle it. She had spent, she was uh, from Sweden, and she had apparently at some point in her life spent six months in South Africa, uh, which gave a sense of how unsafe women were. And stuck in her mind was that there is no way that you're going to get young black women in a poor township who are facing violence in their relationship. There's no way that you are then going to talk about what kind of strength do they have. How, how do they try to manage this? We should really only talk about how um, victimized they are. And that was my experience of, uh, or, or at least let me say, that was my first initiative of decolonizing, uh, I would say, uh, the kind of research I was doing. I wanted to take on a different angle to what was written. And I was immediately shut down. And because I was concerned about finishing my PhD, um, I gave in. Uh, something that I was to regret for a long time afterwards, I gave in and thought, let's just write this paper the way this examiner wants. If this is what fits the Western model of what uh, living in a violent uh, context, in a violent relationship is, let me write it to a satisfaction, get my PhD, and I can do this sort of work later that is much more nuanced. So I've had this personal experience where sexuality-related violence is, uh, research is only meant to uh, speak of uh, 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 those who are affected by it in a particular way that, that doesn't take into account other, other ways of responding. Um, and, 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 so, and yet I find that with the LGBTI, it's so much more important to have a much more nuanced way of, of, of examining uh, the, the violence they experience because of this other, you know, because they experience violence, as I said, in such a compounded way because of the many types of violence that they experience at the same time. Uh, another thing I want to talk about uh, when talking about how sexuality-related violence is uh, positioned in South Africa, or how it speaks about L uh, LGBTI, is that one finds that the sexuality-related violence research that there is only considers uh, black bodies, it only considers black, uh, whatever population you can think of, to only those studies are only conducted amongst black people. This is a conversation that my twin sister and I have had a number of times about how not just this research, of course, uh, but other kinds of studies that, uh, that we do, how they only focus on, on, on black people, as though the experience of violence does not actually transcend so many other uh, identity cate categories. Um, so you have a discipline that focuses very narrowly, largely, focuses on male experiences of uh, sexuality, and one that even when it does incorporate um, other ways of experiencing sexual violence, it's still in a very narrow manner, it's connected to HIV, largely not connected to anything else, and even when that is analyzed and, 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 and thought about, it's still from this one lens that only considers victimization, but not other ways of experiencing and responding to violence. And I connect this, uh, as I said in the beginning of my talk, I connect this to the fact that our thinking around um, um, homosexuality in South Africa, certainly in academic spaces, came in this, you know, in, in, with the colonial um, influence that made certain aspects um, um, invisible. And so this work has also not uh, ex escaped uh, the way in which the, the, the discipline was introduced. So then, in considering this narrow way in which we do research on sexuality-related violence amongst LGBTI, I began to think about what would we need to do if we are decolonizing this. Uh, 
initially I got quite caught up in trying to understand how do we think about decolonizing a practice that does not have a record on how Africans perceived it before uh, colonialism uh, came into the country. So because we don't have pre-colonial records of African perspectives on LGBTQI, what, what are we to decolonize? We not, you know, so how, how are we to bring in African perspectives if we're saying in the context of South Africa, we don't have much material that's saying this is how it was originally considered. But then I found that in reading um, on pluriversality, which I, st I struggled to pronounce, that in fact, decolonization isn't just about considering the historical perspectives and looking at what can be changed about that. It's an aspect of it, as, as, as Floretta shared. But decolonization, the idea of uh, creating a new, you know, new epistemologies that are African-situated, that consider the African experience, and, and in fact, that also consider multiple ways of being, that there isn't just one universal truth, there isn't just one way of conducting research. That, um, that, that, re that, that opens up space for us to do decolonization or to start the work of decolonization on, on sexuality-related violence among LGBTI, where it's beginning with how we approach it, with how, the kind of conversations that we are having about it. So, I want to suggest a number of uh, processes uh, that can help us uh, in this process. Um, and the one I find is that we need to disown the capitalist patriarchal lens that we've been trained to use when thinking about sexuality-related violence. So as I was forced to do by my research assistant, who forced me to come out of that orientation that could only think of gender-based violence in relation to men who are being beaten by women, or rather in relation to women who are being beaten by men, that we need to acknowledge that that thinking comes from the patriarchal orientation that is not only present in our research, but in the orientation of life in general, uh, you know, since colonialism. We need to disown it. We need to know that it isn't necessarily that Africans have always had only this patriarchal way of considering the world. We need to consider that Africans, where we a recording type of, of, of culture would find other ways of, uh, of, of viewing uh, um, you know, matters of this nature. And so we need to completely not, in, in the way in which we train uh, uh, researchers in particular, we need to abandon that uh, uh, heterosexual uh, patriarchal lens. Secondly, our analyses need to go beyond victimization and pathology. And when we do that, we'll begin to design sexuality-related violence studies that go beyond HIV-AIDS linkages. It won't matter if our research question wants to investigate sexuality-related violence among LGBTI completely disconnected to, to, to HIV. Because that's also part of why our research is silent on women, because women are considered to be, women who have sex with women are considered to be not at all at heightened exposure or at risk to, to, to HIV. So they don't become an, impop an important population to consider when doing this kind of research because we, we've made it necessary to only do it when there's a pathology that's linked to it. So our analysis need to go beyond victimization and patho pathology. We need to start seeing what we see in other forms of research where, for instance, the kind of work that I do amongst young people it has started to go beyond looking at deficiencies and what people, young people are at risk of to talking about resilience, to saying, let's look at their resilience. They are faced with multiple oppressions. Life is difficult for a young black child, but they are, they are here. They've not been erased. They are continuing to make it in life in, 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 in different ways and, and uh, you know, to, to different extents of success. And so there must be, rather than just focusing our research on deficiencies, on, on victimization, Let's open it up to look at what about those, despite these very negative and difficult and traumatic experiences, are in fact showing resilience. What is it about them and what can we learn to develop uh, uh, interventions and, and, and programs that are useful? We look at agency not because we want to be able to say, you know, this population is not only victimized. We look at it so we can understand what about this agency that can be harnessed, that can be actually supported so that 
uh, the response to, to these experiences of violence uh, is even more powerful and more effective um, uh, in helping the, the, the individuals uh, involved. And we need to look at powerful rather than just passive uh, and silenced responses. And this is important in the work of dignity that Wanga uh, talked about uh, at the last colloquium. If you are to present uh, research about Africans in particular in manners that pay attention to their dignity, you must have a lot more to say than just that they are victims. You must have a lot more to say than just that they are encountering these multiple oppressions. Your research must be able to show how these are dignified uh, uh, populations who are doing much to contest uh, uh, these difficulties in, 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 in spaces that are, uh, uh, you know, that are rather difficult. Thirdly, I believe that we need to reconstruct curricula on violence that it, so that it includes a focus on LGBTQI. In 2010, I got a scholarship to attend a research methods on gender-based violence course at WITS, which was extremely in intensive. Four weeks of going to class from 7 a.m. until 7 p.m. Every single day except for Saturdays and Sundays, though that also included group work and also some other things. A very intensive program. Of course, that was designed by VITS in conjunction with uh, the London School of um, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And that curriculum, the entire time we were there, not once did we ever consider violence that involved LGBTQI. It was not part of the curriculum. We talked about intimate partner violence amongst adolescents, intimate partner violence amongst uh, older uh, populations. We talked about, even about violence amongst the aging. We talked about violence that is experienced by sex workers. We talked about different types of violence and how to construct and, and develop research methods that would be able to answer the pertinent research questions within each of these populations. But none of it included uh, LGBTQI. And once again, because much of the thinking around violence was framed within the broader discourse of, of HIV. Um, I mean, certainly in that particular study. So, we need to train researchers that are going to know that if you're talking about sexuality-related violence research, it must include LGBTI because they experience oppressions that are not different to those of the other populations that we like to target with our research, namely Africans. They are different, they may be uh, different in terms of their sexual orientation, but they are similar in terms of the poverty they experience, in terms of the race-related uh, struggles that they have, in terms of the class-related uh, challenges that they have. And so, for that reason, if we are saying, because if we are saying we're going to design studies that target people who are affected by structural violence in a particular way, we cannot leave LGBTQI out, uh, regardless of our personal ideas about it. I don't know if this is my last point. Yeah, it is. Lastly, I, would, uh, I want to suggest that we conduct research in decolonizing sexuality-related violence uh, research among LGBTI. We conduct research through partnerships and collaborations that take on various forms. I've been involved in participatory research, and I absolutely am persuaded about it. As a feminist, as a, a, a woke black person, I believe you absolutely must partner with communities, with your affected populations. You, you must have this plural uh, traditions of generating knowledge. There's a lot more for you to learn from there. But it's also an ethical obligation for me. Uh, even if there wasn't much to learn that I'm interested in particular, you know, as a, as, a, as, a, as a professional. But it's extremely important. It's, it's ethical. But I've come to recognize in my interrogation of uh, participatory research that it's not all the same. It's not all empowering. It's not all, hence it's not all going to lead to uh, the, the, the achievements we want to see in terms of decolonization. I think there's a participant here who remarked about that in relation to photo voice, that it does not necessarily mean that it's a, a tool that will always work to, to decolonize. And so what I've learned is that at times you, part, you collaborate and you partner with the so-called affected population, but who you partner with, or at least an analysis of who you partner with would show up, would show up certain exclusions. And so, and I remember even my own thinking when I began to think I want to do this kind of research, I thought I would want to collaborate with LGBTQI activists, hence the first person I, I talked to in that community in Begweni was a prominent 
activist on LGBTIQ uh, uh, um, issues. And yet, that is excluding people who have a different access to power because that activist has been exposed to so much more, has been empowered in so many ways. They have found their voice. That's why they're an activist. They have a different access and a different relationship with po to power than an ordinary person in the community who's gay or lesbian. And so what I'm, 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 I'm pushing for is that we go beyond just these conventional colonial methods of collaborating with others, that we go beyond local experts, that we go beyond uh, groups that are already formally uh, and distinctly um, created, because that's also much easier for us to do, right? It's also much easier as a researcher to work with a group that's already, that exists, or with a person who is affiliated to a formal structure and who's already been oriented in how they can work with research. But I'm saying we're leaving out people who would also gain quite a lot, and that would gain a lot from uh, because of their lack of access to, to formal uh, um, structures of power. Another example of uh, collaborations that need to be empowering and inclusive, because I think that's what I'm actually pushing for, that we need to design uh, participatory research methods that are inclusive. I, uh, as I've said, I do find that they're not necessarily so. Another type of, uh, therefore, way of forming these collaborations that we should be careful of is the kind of institutions that we power with. There are institutions that exist completely outside intellectual power structures that are alienated, actually, from knowledge creation processes. I'm thinking of institutions back where I come from, or UNITRA. You know, those are institutions, universities, they are centers of knowledge, but they may not be involved, or University of Zululand, they may not be the kind of institutions that we partner with. They may be still completely left out of such processes. So we need to take that into account. If, if we want to have a discipline that uh, takes on different types of exclusions, not just uh, those of uh, LGBTI people broadly, but also specific um, actors who are important uh, uh, to this population that, that we've left, left out. Lastly, I want to end with a quote that I found from Zetu Matebeni. Um, which I think is very challenging, and I haven't even spoken to it in the kind of recommendations I've given. It's very challenging to how, where the bar is, really, when it comes to decolonizing sexuality-related violence research that focuses on LGBTI. She talks about how, she says, I would like to call for a querying of African curricula and scholarship. How else can we appreciate the complexity of geopolitical shifts of the sexual diversities that have existed over time and place on our continent? Can we imagine queer African knowledge created by Africans themselves? If we are to imagine a decolonized university, the African Academy would necessarily have to be queered. And the word queer in this context is a verb. And, and as I said, I find this challenge because it's, it shows we don't just need to do a little bit just to change how we you know, construct our methods and our approaches here and there. But in fact, there needs to be, for me to be queered as a researcher when conducting this kind of research means I need to open myself up to some kind of reconstruction in the way in which I see the world. Um, I need to be, I need to reimagine the, the way I, in which I do this work and it needs to so closely identify with being queer, if at all it is to be decolonized. That's it. <laughs>